Darkness is impossible to remember. Consequently, Kiefer's desire to return to those unseen depths where they have just been. It is an addiction. No one is ever satisfied. Darkness never satisfies. Especially if it takes something away, which it almost always invariably does. Analog horror has become a staple of YouTube content, and it's getting harder to define with its every new iteration. The term used to describe the specific style of horror fiction that popped up on the platform. Two famous examples are Local 58 and Gemini Home Entertainment. Rooted in the found footage subgenre of horror, they adopted the low fidelity aesthetic of analog audiovisual technology for example, VHS tapes, and presented themselves as collections of archival footage which, when put together, told a bigger interconnected story. What's interesting is that most of the series in this genre had and still have very little analog uh, anything, being usually made digitally and then manipulated to fit the aesthetic. A sort of uh, digital mimicry, to use Philip Rosen's definition. That's something you should keep in mind, as the term has become kind of a buzzword online. And some content creators don't really like being ascribed to it. But I'm going to use it anyway, because it saves a lot of time. Sorry. The recent examples of the genre have been following the same trend. But at this point, the amount of different approaches to the genre calls for a more in-depth analysis. Analog horror is characterized by a fundamental entanglement of cinema, internet culture, and more. Its origins would take way too long to discuss right now. So here's a very cool table that I made, which summarizes the main influences on the genre. There's a lot to unpack here, so you can pause the video and take a look for yourselves. Instead, I'm going to show you a few examples of what people are calling analog horror, and use them as a case study to try and get a better understanding of the genre. We'll also use traditional cinema as a point of comparison, it being the most recognized and studied type of audiovisual art. This way, we'll see what differentiates and makes analog horror stand apart as its own art form, and also see if its digital mimicry is just a part of a nostalgic drive, as Stephen Prince would put it, or something more. In this house. Skinamarink is a polarizing film. It's very dark and very slow. Too much so for many viewers. But it still blew up on the internet thanks to word of mouth. In spite and thanks to its weird and experimental nature. Two children awaken in a house to a perpetual night. Their parents are gone and soon the doors and the windows disappear too. They try to maintain a sense of normalcy, but it becomes clear that they're not alone. There might just be something in the house with them. This is the movie's bare bones story, but even that is not clear as it is never openly stated. All we have is context clues and a few barely audible lines of dialogue. Most of what we're shown is corners and dark hallways, and all that we see of the children is their feet moving around. Now, what you'll find often online is that this is the directorial debut of Canadian filmmaker Kyle Edward Ball, but that's not exactly true. He has a YouTube channel called Bite Sides Nightmares, in which he's been turning his commenters' nightmares into short horror films. This is also where you'll find his 28-minute short, Heck, a direct precursor of what would become the feature-length Skinamarink. The movie itself was made only with $15,000, mostly crowdfunded, and it's the culmination of everything we see on Bite Sides Nightmares. It feels like the art house film that Ball was working towards all along. Many have called this a feature-length analog horror film. It does have the same slow burn, what the hell is going on style that characterizes the genre. I'll give him that. Also, while the movie is shot digitally, it does try to imitate that analog VHS feel by adding lots of film grain in post. This is obviously not a mere stylistic choice. We could compare Skinamarink to Kyoshi Kurosawa's Cairo, 
a masterful ghost movie in which the contrast between digital and analog audiovisual technologies plays a major role. We can go in depth right now, but there's a good paper by Kit Hughes about it, which I encourage you to read. At one point, Hughes mentions that one of Kurosawa's techniques is that of implying presence where there is none, shaping a spectre through absence, through empty frames. This is pretty much 90% of Skinamarink. All the pitch black doorways, the shadows in the corners of the ceiling, the empty hallways. We almost never see real ghostly presences, but thanks to the film grain distorting the darkness, we always feel like there are. Anyway, while Skinamarink definitely shares some similarities with the genre, it is a different thing. I'd argue that the conception and the existence of analog horror is fundamentally tied to YouTube. And while Ball has a horror YouTube channel, it's pretty clear that it's mostly a sort of portfolio, a place for experimentation and practice, which is implied by the director himself. It was a process. Heck was, let's see how this experiment goes, but also I'll change a few things, and when I get to the feature, I'll know I want to do this and that. Skinamarink premiered at the 26th Fantasia Film Festival, and it's definitely cinema, although not really analog horror. But it does seem like it takes a few clues from the genre. Kim Pixels became famous for his YouTube horror series about the back rooms. On July 2nd, 1988, the ASIN research facility tested its low proximity magnetic distortion system for the third time. During a press conference held in April of 1988. Originally born from an internet meme, it chronicles the story of Async Foundation as it researches, explores and tries to harness dangerous and mysterious spaces that seem to exist beyond our comprehension of space and time. It's very skillfully animated in Blender and mostly told through found footage, with the more recent addition of live-action bits. Kane is now working with A24 to make a feature-length Backrooms movie, but that doesn't mean that his YouTube content is over. He has a lot planned for the future. His latest ongoing series, The Oldest View, reflects upon digital spaces and found footage as a form of archival of real-world spaces and art. It mostly follows the same style he'd already used for the back rooms, a first-person view of someone exploring a liminal space, another buzzword, I know, but... It is what it is. <laughs> but here, his already amazing animation abilities and his attention to detail have really grown. It's 3D rendered footage made to look like real found footage that explores a 3D space which recreates a space that existed in reality but is now only real in this 3D space because it has been destroyed in the real world. It's quite convoluted. So, is this analog horror? Kane has a pretty clear idea. Since you guys are giving me a platform here, I need to say in front of everyone, the oldest view is not analog horror. Please. <laughs> it's no. not analog oh horror. God. I don't know, man. That You know what? He's got a camera. Where's the analog? As far as I know, as far as I Show it to me. Show me the analog. Analog. I don't know. So, I don't know, man. If it's found, if it's any kind of found footage, it might be analog horror. Though many still put it and the back rooms under the same umbrella. The reasons are obvious. Again, this is slow burn experimental horror that we can find on YouTube. In this case, it does tell a bigger interconnected story in a non-linear fashion, as opposed to bite-sized nightmares. It also takes advantage of the platform's strengths, like not having a standardized runtime and publishing schedule, and being able to interact with the audience in between episodes, which is not always the best, apparently. If I don't post for like a single month, and then everyone in the comments you no. can search by new, it gets so bad. It gets yeah. atrocious. No, Everyone's I... like, what is wrong with you? You're squandering your potential. You should be making videos for us right now. Oh but instead, you're off like 
Kane, you don't know what you're doing. That's me. That's I me want backroom now. <laughs> but I want it now. And while, as Kane points out, there's nothing analog about the oldest view, the backrooms definitely fit the analog horror genre. So, about that A24 project. It might work well, seeing as Kane's style is applicable to a more traditional found footage format. But we'll see. I'm very curious to see how the analog part of it will be incorporated. Or if they just leave it out. Now we come to two guys that show us why pure analog horror, if such a thing even exists, could never work in a theater. Let's start with Alex Kister, the mind behind the Mandela catalog. This is what most people online will think when they hear analog horror. Mandela County has a big problem. It seems that demons from another dimension are using audiovisual technology to infiltrate our world. Hey look, just like the ghosts in Kurosawa Skyro, they then proceed to replace people, taking over religious and legal institutions, to prepare the ground for something much more sinister. Kister uses existing and original footage, distorting everything through a grungy DIY lo-fi aesthetic. Mixing live action, children's animation, blender animations, archival and found footage, and so on and so on. The narrative is decentered, as is often the case with this genre. We never follow a single character. Instead, we see multiple points of view through a non-linear timeline, and the world itself and its many mysteries are the focus. For example, something that is often used in analog horror and that Kister uses too is the informational videos approach, an apparently objective look at the world which always hides disturbing details. In this case, we can see all the necessary elements that make up the genre. It's fascinating too how the analog technology itself is used as an element of storytelling, becoming a meditation on the genre itself actively asking why it works the way it does, and why are people attracted by it. What's so special about this aesthetic and style of storytelling? Because it's definitely not just digital mimicry born of a mere nostalgic drive. Then we have Alex Kansas, aka Mr. Manicore, creator of the Monument Mythos. And here, I'm not sure of where to start. See how the serves work the ground. And they give it all they've got. And you give it all you've got. And we give it all we've got to a down. Manicor uses a series to deconstruct reality self as fiction, changing the past and the present, manipulating photographs, videos, making up non-existing interviews of famous people, inserting current internet memes into a series and feeding off the memes that the audience makes about it. While analog horror is very often non-linear, Manicor's stuff is beyond that. The monument mythos explodes in all directions. Something spooky hides under American monuments. James Dean becomes president, but he's the devil. In another world, Nixon becomes Superman. In the current world, that has seemingly been wiped out or turned into a comic book, I'm not sure. Robert Pattinson becomes president, I think. I mean, that doesn't really look like Rob. Oh wait, now it does. Also, there's a special glass that can cut your head without killing you, but then the head becomes a giant balloon. Uh, by the way, there are pyramids on Mars, and Elon Musk blows them up with atom bombs, freeing a giant serpent god to the sound of dubstep. Are you insane? Yeah. It all sounds random, but it's impossible to make a synopsis of the monument mythos, because it's just so much. To me, the series is a reply to What's more postmodern than postmodernism itself? Let's take Umberto Eco's definition in his postscript to the name of the rose. 
The moment comes when the avant-garde, the modern, can go no further, because it has produced a meta-language that speaks of its impossible texts, conceptual art. The postmodern reply to the modern consists of recognizing that the past, since it cannot really be destroyed, because its destruction leads to silence, must be revisited, but with irony, not innocently. Manicor does all that and goes beyond. It also gives us more clearly reasons for which this genre is so fascinating. On one hand, it follows, consciously or not, the media archaeological impulse that blew up in the 90s. There is a fascination in uncovering and manipulating existing footage from the past, or even from the present. Just look at how viral lost media has become in the last decade. Then, think back to things like Bruce Sterling's Dead Media Project founded in 1996, and the symposium An Archaeology of Imaginary Media, organized by Eric Kluitenberg in 2004. It's not a new trend. Hell, we could even go back to the archival cinema of Chris Marker or Harun Faroki. On the other hand, analog horror also splendidly allows for what-if scenarios, following the success of ARGs, showing us worlds that are very close to ours, but in which something, at a certain point, went horribly, horribly wrong. It gives us new perspectives on our own reality, allowing us to better question it. So, this time, it's all undeniably analog horror. But, is it cinema? Obviously, someone would ask, well, what is cinema? And the quickest answer is, it's what you want it to be. Lisa, the point of Moby Dick is be yourself. Just kidding. It's obviously hard to define. And there is still much discussion about it, especially after Deleuze started dropping his bombs on the matter. That's why I prefer to use the term traditional cinema here, in the sense of what most people would recognize instinctually as cinema at this point. The stuff you'd see in theaters, broadly speaking. So I'll change the question into, could this be shown in a theater? Well, Skinner Inc. obviously already has. The back room soon will, although with yet unknown results. And the last two examples? Definitely not. It seems that the closer it moves to the analog horror genre, the less theater-friendly the content becomes. This also explains the strong polarization in Skinner Inc.'s reception. People either loved it or hated it, probably because many went in expecting a normal horror flick. While here, we're in the area of experimentation, of strange detours. It is never at the beginning that something new, a new art, is able to reveal its essence. What it was from the outset, it can reveal only after detour in its evolution. In each stage, the seeds are already there for the next stage, and the evolution is also a detour, an aberration that may be as much a return to something left undeveloped in a more primitive state as it is something truly new. So, we've established that this genre stands apart from traditional cinema. But why is it so darn cool? Well, for one, it brings back the whole real ghosts caught on video type of stuff, which pretty much disappeared after the spread of high quality phone cameras. So, maybe this particular side of it is tied to a nostalgic drive. But there's more. While most fictional content on YouTube has usually been imitating traditional cinema and TV formats, analog horror breaks out from that mold and uses the platform to its full potential, something we've already briefly discussed. At this point, you don't see comments like It's crazy that this has been made on YouTube by one guy or Imagine what they could do with a Hollywood budget anymore. And that's because the audience realized that it perfectly works the way it is. Just look at the difference in length and release time between the different chapters of these projects. Look at how they thrive on fan interactions and others making videos about them. I'm looking at you, Weisberg boy. The platform allows for stuff you'd never see in traditional media, like deleting and re-uploading videos changing their context, changing titles and descriptions, exploring the content at your own pace, and so on and so on. Which takes us to the last point. 
With streaming platforms and the like, we've seen a passage of cinema from theaters to people's homes, at least to some degree. But their content is still mostly the fruit of big production teams and big film studios, which always implies a degree of compromise. With analog horror, we're seeing series made by one person, or really small teams, which have complete artistic freedom, actually listen to their audiences, and are doing this purely for the sake of the art itself. Just think about the recent strikes and protests by American writers and actors, or the big 2008 strikes. Hollywood is absolutely indecent with how they treat their workers. It is an old and rusting beast that insists on living on the shoulders of talented and underpaid people. With stuff like analog horror and online user-based content, these problems pretty much disappear, although there are other difficulties, obviously. But look at these series success. They collect millions of views, so maybe it's time for some real change. All in all, this is very exciting for the future.